So we want to talk this evening about peace treaties will not bring lasting peace to Israel. And uh, it's important that we have a, a few ground rules, I guess, for talking about a subject which can be really controversial. It seems to me these days that any time anyone talks about something to do with Israel, it's a hot subject. And there are people who have very strong opinions about Israel and whether they're right or wrong. And so I just want to set a few ground rules for our conversation this evening. Firstly, Christadelphians, while we are pro-Israel, we are not blind to the issues that swirl around the Jewish state. We, we as Christadelphians are pro-Israel, not because we agree with modern Israel's political or ideological rationale or narrative, but because of what the Bible says about those people. The Bible is not uncritical of Jewry, modern or past. But the Apostle Paul made it very, very clear that the Jewish people are to be beloved for the Father's sake. And because the Bible says it, we believe it to be true. And we support the Jewish cause, not for ideological, not for political region, reasons, but because God said so. And so, yes, we acknowledge the suffering and the injustice that has been experienced by the people in that land, both Palestinian and Jewish, Arab and Israeli alike. We don't take a side in that particular matter, but we do love the Jewish people for the Father's sake. So that's point one. We're also not here to present our own point of view. We're not, as believers, right-leaning or left-aligned. We have no political leaning. Our worldview is informed by the Word of God and, hopefully, by nothing else. We're not informed by YouTube or Facebook, but by this book, the Bible. And hopefully you've not come here to hear my opinion this evening, but the opinion of the Bible, and, and I hope that's what we'll give you. And if that's not the case, Feel free to come and tell me off over, over uh, a cup of tea later on. And our final ground rule, I guess, is this, that our objective this evening is to give you the raw, unvarnished facts from the biblical point of view. The biblical point of view is exactly what our title said. Peace treaties will not bring lasting peace to Israel. And what we want to do this evening is answer the, the unspoken question that lies behind our title. The key question. And, and as depressing as our title may have sounded, with its implied promise of another conflict, another war, yet another one in the Middle East, we don't want you to leave our presentation tonight um, downcast. Because the answer to what will bring lasting peace to the Middle East and to Israel, we think is so overwhelmingly positive and exciting that hopefully you'll walk away this evening encouraged rather than pulled down. So our goal tonight is to finish on something really, really upbeat, even though we have to talk about something that is inevitably leading the Middle East to war. All right, so let's get our bearings. Uh, some of this is obviously for people who might not be particularly familiar with the subject of Israel. And so we'll start with a map. Uh, this is uh, a map of the world. As you can see, it's got all of the parts, Europe, Asia, and Africa. You're allowed to smile at that. Um, it's a pretty bad map uh, for those of you who are familiar with maps. Um, this is by a guy by the name of Bunting in 1581, but what it does do for us is make a very useful point about the way people over the generations have viewed Israel, because there, right at the centre of the world is Jerusalem and Israel. So in the 1500s and the 16th century in Europe, Europeans believed and saw Israel as the center of the world. Now, of course, it's not geographically, not 
exactly. But it's the center of the world for our topic this evening. So just making sure we know which country we're talking about. And uh, some of you may have experienced this talking to people and, and they have no idea where Israel is on a map. This is the Israel that we're going to be talking about this evening that is not going to experience peace because of the peace treaties being signed. And, and for those of you who know your history, you will know that this little stretch of land has experienced unrelenting conflict, unrelenting war, not just over the last hundred years, but over the last millennia or so. Just taking the lifespan of people in this hall as, as a, I guess, a bit of a barometer, uh, there's been war after war. My, my father just happened to be born in the year that this newspaper article came out. The Holy Land War is raging in 1948. The Evening Telegram heralding a new war in the Middle East as the War of Independence raged after the lifting of the British partition in Israel. 1956. The Sinai campaign for Suez, another war erupting between Israel and its Arabic neighbors. 1967, the famous Six Day War in which we're told bullets went, as it were, around corners. The Yom Kippur War in 1973, in which unprovoked a number of Arabic nations mounted a surprise attack on Israeli forces. 1982, the beginning of a long Lebanon war, and on and on we could go, conflict after conflict, war after war. In fact, and this is a conservative estimate, over 118 wars have been fought in the land of Israel during its Jewish in fact, arguably, there is no other piece of ground on the planet that has been so bitterly contested as the land of Israel. This is just a list of a few of the people who have decided that they would like to shed blood for this piece of territory. Sad. But... It's exactly what the Bible said would be the case. Zechariah the prophet said... Speaking of a future time, but nonetheless, his statement is relevant for us today, that, that Jerusalem, the capital of the land of Israel, will be a burdensome stone for all people. All that burden themselves in this land with capturing this territory will be cut to pieces. And again and again and again, that has been the experience of those who would conquer this land. I think it would be very, very hard for anybody to argue that any other place in the world has generated so much in the way of news headlines, has caused so much sorrow, over which more wars have been fought. And so this description of Israel and of Jerusalem is so apt of a heavy stone, a Sisyphean task for the world, finding peace in the Middle East. And, you know, if you did an assessment of all of the newspaper articles that have been written about wars and violence and conflict in the Middle East and around Israel, you would have in your mind a picture of a vast territory, no doubt with jagged edges and swords poking out everywhere, but some huge land that's really worth it. And yet, you put Israel on a map, it's tiny. You could squeeze it in between almost Malawa and Rockingham. And that's it. Hardly worth it. And yet, the best, the brightest, the most powerful leaders in the planet have dedicated their careers to achieving peace. Hook or by crook in this territory. And, and over the years, again and again, attempts have been made to find peace. The unrelenting war, I think, goes some way to explaining why so many leaders have expended so much effort. And here is Menahem Begin with Jimmy Carter and Anwar Sadat, the leaders of Israel, the United States of America and of Egypt at Camp David, signing the famous Camp David Accords, the first 
Arabic African nation to sign peace with Israel. A recognition of the right of the Jewish people to inhabit that small sliver of territory that they call their own. 1978, I was uh, two years old. It's a long time ago now, and, and it was a long time before the next nation in the region signed a deal with Israel. This is a photo from the treaty between the state of Israel and the Hashemite kingdom of Jordan. You can see President Clinton with a number of other leaders, including the king of Jordan. I think that might be Rabin. Yes, I can't tell. Simeon, Rabin, do you think? Simeon's saying, yes, definitely Rabin. So if I'm wrong, it was Simeon's fault. Um, they're signing a deal with Jordan, recognizing Israel's right to exist and right to a peaceful coexistence in the Middle East. 1978, 1994, and then nothing until in the heart of COVID territory, the middle of a pandemic, and all of a sudden things start changing. Here is the signing of the Arab Accords, actually two nations signing a treaty with the Jews in September last year. Bahrain and the Emirates signing what's now being called the, the Abraham Accords. Isn't that fascinating? We started our evening by saying that we love the Jewish people for the Father's sake, for Abraham's sake. And they chose to call this treaty between two Arab nations, the Abraham Accords. October, another one. How strong this one proves to be will be very interesting. I think we'll see by the end of our evening tonight that this particular treaty will not stand the test of time in any shape or flavor. But nonetheless, in October, a triumphant Mr. Trump announced that Sudan had agreed to normalize relations with Israel. And then in December, Morocco chose to do the same. This is unprecedented. We've gone years and years and years and years with no other nation deciding to get closer to the Jewish people and all of a sudden four in a row one two three four and Jared Kushner who is the son-in-law to Trump was influential in uh, negotiating some of these agreements wrote an article in the Wall Street Journal just last week he is no longer got any involvement in the Middle East peace process, but he said last week in this article in the Wall Street Journal that Saudi Arabia, Qatar, Oman and Mauritania, now for those of you not familiar with Mauritania, it's that country way over there on the, uh, on the western coast of Africa, south of Morocco, all four of those countries are on the cusp of signing agreements with Israel. And Israeli sources add one more, the nation of Niger in North Africa, likewise a strongly Islamic country. Five nations apparently on the cusp of signing treaties with Israel. All in a period of four or five months. In the middle of a pandemic, when no one can fly anyway anyway. Isn't that remarkable? Jared Kushner went on to say, he said this, I'm just going to flip back a slide, pardon me. He went on to say, we are witnessing the last vestiges of what has been known as the Arab-Israeli conflict. Strong words. And the real question is, is he right? Is this a prelude to peace in the Middle East for Israel? Will these treaties usher in an era of peace for Israel? And you'll see, I've been generous with my red here, mapping all of the countries that have said 
or the Israelis and the Americans have said may well sign treaties. But you can see Israel is almost now surrounded by nations that are either supporting them or have said they may well in the near future. So is this the prelude to peace? Now, those of us who have read Ezekiel 38 before know that it's not. But there is this passage, Ezekiel 38, verse 11. In fact, we'll start with verse 8, in fact. Ezekiel 38, verse 8, after many days you shall be visited. This sounds quite nice. Someone's going to drop round for a cup of tea. After many days you'll be visited for tea and biscuits. In the latter days, in the latter years, you shall come back into the land that is bought back from the sword and is gathered out of many people. You'll come against the mountains of Israel, which have always been waste. It's brought back out of the nations and they shall dwell safely, all of them. It sounds lovely, doesn't it? They're going to dwell safely, all of them. Or as you can see on the screen, verse 11 says, you'll go and you'll visit, going up to the land of unwalled villages. Those that are at rest, those that dwell safely, they don't have bars or gates. And the prophet Ezekiel here describes a time well, a time of peace, a time of peace treaties, if you like, when Israel will be characterized by restful, peaceful ways of life. Where Israel, if you like, will have the confidence to leave the house unlocked, the keys to the car in the ignition, and trade in their old armored rocket launcher for just the new SUV to take the family on a holiday. As it were. Now, we haven't yet proved, certainly, that what's being talked of in verse 11 here is a prediction of, of Israel, and we'll try and do that in a moment. But the question is, is this verse, verse 11, a prediction of an era of peace for the Middle East and for Israel? And of course, we've read the chapter together tonight. Our chairman read it for us. We know the answer to that question, don't we? Should all be going, no, it really isn't. This is not predicting an era of peace for the Middle East. In fact, this chapter goes on to, to, to describe the build up and the, 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 the connection of a cataclysmic war. And a war that is focused on Israel. How do we know that this war will be focused on Israel? Well, we read on verse 12. When this nation comes to visit, it won't be, as we lightheartedly said, for tea and biscuits. No, it will be, verse 12, to take a spoil, to take a prey, to invade, to pillage, to ravage. This visitor will turn their hand upon the desolate places that are now inhabited, the people which are gathered out of the nations. Now, who are they? Who are these people who live in a desolate land that is now inhabited? Who are these people that are a nation gathered from many nations? How do we know that this is speaking of Israel in verse 12? Well, let's flip back one chapter. Ezekiel 37, a very, very exciting chapter. Ezekiel 37 is, is a poetic chapter. In fact, there's a song that gets its lyrics from this chapter. A Negro spiritual, the knee bone connects to the thigh bone, the thigh bone to the neck bone, the neck bone to the foot bone, and so on and so on. You know the words to that song, I'm sure. And it says in Ezekiel chapter 37, verse 11, then someone spoke to Ezekiel and said to Ezekiel, son of man, these bones. You see, what Ezekiel has seen is he's seen this, this hideous sight, this, this deep ravine, shadowed and murky, full of bones, dry, cracking bones. And then this voice says to Ezekiel, these bones, Ezekiel, they're the house of Israel. Behold, the house of Israel says our bones are dried, our hope is lost, we are cut off in our parts. And there was a period of time 
in the 20th century when that was absolutely true. There was an eerie similarity between the scene that Ezekiel had painted for him in Ezekiel 37 and the pictures that emerged in the newspapers from Nazi Europe. The valleys of corpses mirrored the story told in Ezekiel 37. But that's not where the prophecy of Ezekiel 37 ended, it did it. it. It went on to speak in verse 12 and said, Therefore prophesy and say unto them, that is the house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, Behold, O my people, God still sees them as his people, I will open your graves and I will cause you to come up out of your graves and I will bring you into the land of Israel. And the flow of thought of this chapter continues on. Chapter uh, verse 22. And I will make them one nation in the land on the mountains of Israel. Across to chapter 38 and verse 8. After many days you shall be visited. In the latter days thou shalt come back from the land that is brought back from the sword. And is gathered out of many peoples against the mountains of Israel. These chapters are all about Israel and what's going to happen to the people of Israel. Of that there can be no doubt. And in fact, it's not, we're not just left up to the context to work that out. Ezekiel 38 verse 12 told us that these people would be gathered out of all nations. And, and that's exactly what happened to the Jewish people. In fact, there, there's almost no other nation in the world that has experienced a diaspora like the Jews and a return. Try and think of one. There's none. There's nations that have experienced amazing diasporas. The Irish and the Romani and many others beside. But those for whom their diaspora has been reversed. There's only one. And so we're not just guided by context. There is only one nation that fits the criteria of being a nation that is gathered out of many nations. And the numbers on those screens, on the screen there, represents the approximate number of Jews that returned to the land of Israel from some of those nations. So, so we know in Ezekiel 38 exactly who Ezekiel saw being invaded. It was going to be the nation of Israel. And so our question was, well, will peace treaties Result in lasting peace? Well, Ezekiel says no. The nation of Israel will experience a stunning surprise attack by many nations at a time when the peace treaties they have signed would lead them to believe they are safe and secure. And importantly, these verses give us a timeline of when the surprise attack or invasion will happen because it will happen after the Jewish people are gathered back from all nations, 1947 and the years that preceded it, and after Israel finds peace. When did Israel find peace? Well, I think you could make a pretty strong argument about two months ago through to now. Any time from here on in, we can expect from the prophet Ezekiel to see a stunning surprise attack on the people of Israel. By who? Well, let, let's start with the neighbours. Ezekiel 38 is a very, very relevant chapter. It's very contemporary and it talks about nations that are contemporary to Israel and near to Israel. Verse 8, uh, pardon me, not verse 8, verse 5. What, who are some of these invaders? Well, here's some. Persia, Ethiopia, and Libya. Well, who are these? Well, Libya, the Hebrew word is put, and it refers, shockingly, to Libya. It's not a tricky one. But that's a giveaway. If anyone says to you, what does the ancient name of Libya mean? It means Libya. What about Persia? Where is Persia on a map today? Well, interestingly enough, in 1935, 
a country changed its name. There was a country by the name of Persia, and it changed its name to Iran. Because you see, the Iranian Iranian Empire uh, uh, government, in the in the lead up to the Second World War, requested all countries with which it had diplomatic relations to change its name in their books. We have been called Persia for the last couple of thousand years, but we'd like you to change our name to Iran. Intriguingly. And this tells us something about the character of Iran. The reason was they had been talking to their friends, the Nazis. And the Nazis felt that a name that sounded a bit like Aryan would be a great name to have in the Middle East. The Aryan Empire. True story. But what about Ethiopia? Where is Ethiopia? If Libya is Libya, surely Ethiopia is just Ethiopia. Well, it's actually a little bit more tricky. Not too much, but just a little. I think this is Fawcett's Bible Dictionary. He says that Ethiopia, the Hebrew word Kush, speaks of, and it should be south of Egypt, south of Egypt, now Nubia, Sinar, Kardafan, and northern Abyssinia. And many of you will have holidayed in those locations. So I probably don't need to go through too much more. But for those of you who have not visited these locations, Wiki puts the kingdom of Kush or Ethiopia. Well, you can see where it is on that map. It's south of Egypt. And that might be a little bit small for some of you, don't worry. We'll, we'll make it larger in a minute. The Kingdom of Kush on a map. Here's overlaying, we'll just overlay the wiki on it. Basically, it's Sudan. Sudan. <laughs> the second most recent nation to sign a treaty with Israel is here mentioned in Ezekiel 38. They're in an alliance. They're in an alliance with the attackers of the Jewish people. And verse 2 and 3 tells us who that alliance is comprised of. Verse 2, Son of man, set your face against Go, the land of Mago, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and prophesy against them and say, Thus saith the Lord God, I'm against you, O Go, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. So, so who are these nations that are in alliance with Libya and Sudan and Iran. Who are they? Well, the first of them mentioned there is Magog. Who is this Magog? Well, we first came across Magog in Genesis chapter uh, 10, I think. Um, and Magog is described as one of the sons of Japheth, the grandson of Moses, the man who famously survived the cataclysmic flood on an ark with all the world's animals. And each of Noah's descendants went on to father nations. We're not going to go there, but uh, you'll find in, in Genesis chapter 10 some other nations that we've already covered. There's Cush, Sudan, there's Put, there's Libya. Well, who's this Magog? Who did, who did Magog go on to become? Because I'm not familiar with any Magog on the world stage. What would Ezekiel have understood by the name Magog? This handsome looking gentleman on the screen now is Flavius Josephus, a Jewish historian, and, and he spent some time recording different nations and who they were and what they did and where they came from. And he notes that Mo Magog was founded from him who were called the Magogites, but who by the Greeks are called the Scythians. Scythians. You might have heard of the Scythians. In fact, the Bible mentions the Scythians once, just once. Here it is. I've got a dramatic picture. This picture will make more sense in a minute. But here's the one and only place in the Bible where the Scythians are mentioned as Scythians. It says, there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian or Scythian, bond nor free. These are couplets. And here the Scythians are grouped together with barbarians. And in the Greek, the Apostle Paul in this passage is making a powerful point. He's not just merely naming nations at random. He's, he's already done that. He said there's, there's Jews and there's non-Jews. There's Greeks. 
Barbarian means foreigner. But Scythian, Scythian means something different to the Greek mind. Scythian meant savage. Foreigner or savage is what the apostle is saying here. And, and it's a very relevant question to ask ourselves, what would Ezekiel have understood by the terms Magog or Scythian for that matter? And amazingly, the Scythians made history in the Middle East right around the time of Ezekiel. In fact, the Scythians would have been front page news if they had newspapers in the time of Ezekiel and in his childhood. Here's what Herodotus, a man described wrongly as the father of history, had to say about the Scythians. He says this, in what concerns war and warning, advance warning, this is, this is quite strong stuff, but it explains why the Scythians were described by the apostle as savages. It says, in what concerns war, their customs are the following. The Scythian soldier drinks the blood of the first man he overthrows in battle. In order to strip the skull of his covering, and he goes on to describe how they would scalp their enemies. When prisoners of war are taken, he says, out of every hundred men, they sacrifice one. First, they do these other things, and he goes on to describe how they prepare bodies for death, and, and, and this is one of the weirdest things, uh, they, they smoke marijuana in tents. And historians coming after Herodotus really rubbished what he had to say. He said, this is, this is nonsense. No one is that savage, that fearful and terrifying and crazed. There's a story that Herodotus records of how the entire Scythian army was fighting against the Persians. And they're about to beat the Persians and then the entire Scythian army raced away in an opposite direction because they were all chasing the same hare and got distracted. This is how people viewed them at the time as these mad, crazy savages. And we would have thought, well, that's nonsense, except the fact that up in the steppes of Russia, an impressive set of tombs was found. They're called the Prazink Ice Tombs. They're called ice tombs because what happened is uh, grave robbers found the entrance to these tombs and managed to get in. And unfortunately, or actually fortunately, when they left with their booty, they left the door ajar to these tombs. And what that meant is in the extreme cold of these ice, icy regions, uh, the ice crept in underground over time and filled the tombs and stayed there. The ice preserved the contents of these tombs until it was recently found. And do you know what they found in these clearly Scythian tombs in the steppes of southern Russia? They found human scalp napkins and the paraphernalia with which to smoke marijuana. Supporting the stories that Herodotus had recorded of a wild and savage horde. Now you might think, well, what's the relevance of this to our subject? Well, in around 625, a Persian king died and he was succeeded by his son. And well, his son witnessed the invasion of a great army of Scythians. What happened was the Scythians were up in the Russian steppes and they had an enemy called the Chimerians and, and they were chasing these Chimerians to and fro over the steppes, the trackless steppes of Russia. And eventually the Chimerians got so scared that they crossed over the mountains of the northern Taurus and plunged down into the Middle East through Persia, through Media and South. And the Scythians being Scythians, they didn't know when to stop and they did exactly the same, up over the northern Taurus and cascading down on their horses, down into the plains of the Middle East. And when they got there, they went, huh, this is good. There's, there's lots of 
territory, lots of cities to pillage and plunder here. And they went on a wild plundering spree. They captured most of Turkey and ruled it for over 28 years and then continued on south in an invasion that struck terror into the hearts of whole empires. They marched against Egypt and they were so threatening and so terrifying to the Egyptian king, Samtik, that he pleaded them to make an agreement with him. And he paid them a vast sum of money, and after which they turned around, marched south and only captured a few places, among them, famously, Ashkelon. And so they went up north, out of Egypt and left Egypt alone plundering and looting as they went north, north, from, through the land of Israel and back up towards Persia and towards uh, the, the Assyrian kingdom of the time. And when did this all happen? When did this terrifying invasion of crazed savages sweeping down out of the north, down as far as Egypt, before turning back to north again and capturing territories in the land of Israel. When did that occur? Well, we can tell from the kings who signed agreements and who recorded the invasion of the Scythians that it happened around the time of Josiah. In other words, right in the youth of men like Daniel and Jeremiah. Now, there's not much left of the Scythian invasion. They, they really weren't the sort of people to leave much behind. They were breakers, not builders. But there is one vestige of their invasion that remains behind. You see, the city of bet -Shan, well, it's been called bet -Shan for a very long time. It's still called bet -Shan today. This is the place where Saul was fastened by the Philistines. But it got renamed, very briefly, it got named Scythiopolis. And many historians believe that this was a, if you like, something left behind, a vestige of the Scythian invasion. I think we can safely say that Ezekiel would have known all about Scythian invasions, all about terrifying invaders plunging out of the trackless steppes of the north to capture and to plunder and to raid. In the time of Ezekiel, people would have been terrified. They would wake up in a sweat in their sleep at the thought of yet another invasion by the Scythians, by those people of, of Magog. And they would have been terrified of what would happen. I mean, even at this time, they contributed to the, the defeat of the Assyrian Empire. They pummeled the mighty Babylonian Empire uh, into paying tribute. They forced the Egyptians to pay tribute too. And then, then they just melted away as if they'd never existed in the first place. So the question at that time would have been, well, will they invade again? And Ezekiel wrote his book. He was told by God, yes, yes, they will. For 2,500 years, the Scythians remained away. No such thing has happened. Just a map showing for you the, the extent of the Scythian Empire. And that picture is from an Assyrian uh, an Assyrian wall, a piece of wall art, I think it's actually Persian piece of wall art, showing the traditional costume of a Scythian archer. So what happened to the Scythians? What happened to Magog? Well, Herodotus went on to say that they, they ended up moving north again and spreading from the river Danius or the Don along the banks of the Ister and the Danube. So where's that? Let's put that on a map. Where, where did the people of Scythia, the Magogites, end up? Well, here's Europe. Let's zoom in. Herodotus mentioned the river Danius, the Tanius, and the Don. The Danube and the Don. And I've marked them there for you. The western river is the, the Danube and the, the eastern river is the Don. This 
is the territory of Magog. Eastern Europe in general, Germany and Poland and Ukraine and Romania and Belarus, Austria, Hungary, Russia, Eastern Europe in general. Interesting. At the heart of the Scythian territory was Russia. And we were told in Ezekiel 38 that these nations will be allied with Iran and Sudan and Libya. But Ezekiel doesn't leave us to guess whether Russia will be part of this or not. He doesn't leave us with a, a nebulous term like, uh, like Magog. He go, gets more specific. And most of you will know this, that in the Septuagint version and almost every other reliable version or, or um, textually accurate version of Ezekiel 38 verse 2, that there is another name in there. It's the name Rosh comes up again and again, Ezekiel 38, verse 2 and 3. This is, you'll find this in Rotherham and the or, uh, Rotherham and Young Literal and Subjurgan and the Jewish Bible and Derby and many others beside. Rosh will be one of the nations that is part of this land of Magog. A province of the land of Magog will be a kingdom called Rosh. You might think to yourself, well, where's Rosh? Well, Rosh was a kingdom known in the time of the Assyrians. Here's Ashurbanipal's cylinder in which he records invading the Rashi. I can't tell you quite where on the cylinder it says the Rashi, but it does, I'm told. Now this cylinder is dated from between 934 to 609 BC, somewhere in that, that time period. In other words, roughly, it could have overlapped the lifespan of Ezekiel. Ashurbanipal, writing at this time, tells us that he knew of a people called the Rashi. Over 1,600 years later on, the Russian Primary Chronicle, this is a document that the Russian people believe or see as their foundational historical document, says this. They said to themselves, let us seek a prince who will rule over us. This is the Slavic people of Western Russia that they may judge us according to law. And accordingly, they went overseas to a group of people called the Varangian Rus. And so the Slavic people of Western Russia were ruled by the Rus. 10th century Persian explorer said this, as for the Rus, they live on an island and, and they force the people around them, the Slavs in particular, to pay tribute. And so there was a kingdom, this again from Wikipedia, called the Rusin Kingdom, the Kievian Rus. Ezekiel would have known what was meant by these terms. They would not have been foreign to Ezekiel. And so I think we can safely say that Rosh is our modern day Russia, just as Ethiopia is modern day Sudan. But there's other names, and let's fly over some of these quite quickly. There's, Mish there's Meshach. Sir Walter Raleigh, uh, the famous uh, nautical, nautical man, said that Meshach, from, him de uh, from them descended the Muscovians. And interestingly enough, if you look up the Meshachian or Meshkarian lowlands on a map, you'll get this. This is the territory of Meshachia. Apparently quite nice to holiday in for about one month of the year when this is not all frozen over. Who was Tubal? Well, Josephus says, Tobal gave rise to the Thobelis, who are now called the Iberians. Now, just in case we're confused, that doesn't mean the Spanish. That means the Caucasian Iberians. Where's that? Well, this is a map of, of uh, central Russia. And you'll notice that there's a number of places with very similar names marked there. Can you see that? Tubolka, Tubolsk, Tobol, Tubolski. It represents this name Tubal, central and eastern Russia. And so what we're being told way back in the time of Ezekiel is that the land of Magog, a great Scythian empire encompassing Russia, modern-day Ukraine, Meshek, modern-day Moscovy, Tubal, modern-day Central and Eastern Russia, together with many other nations beside, will invade 
the Middle East. Will there be peace? Of course not. Ezekiel said that they would come south, that they would invade, that they would seize the treasures of the nations they came upon and they would invade them. And let's, let's look together at verse 16. Speaking here to this great confederacy, God said, Russia, Scythians, Sudanese, Persians, Iranians, and all of these people, he says, you shall come up against my people, the people of Israel, as a cloud to cover the land. They will invade. A terrible conflict. Will peace treaties lead to lasting peace for Israel? No, Ezekiel says it won't. Come across to Psalm chapter 2. Psalm chapter 2 and verse 7. This is another passage that talks about the same period of time. And here the psalmist writes, I will declare the decree. The Lord has said unto me, you are my son, this day have I begotten you. These are words that were spoken to the Lord Jesus Christ and will be spoken to him again. And God says to Jesus, ask of me and I shall give of you the nations, the heathen, for your inheritance. The uttermost parts of the earth for your possession. Here God is promising Jesus Christ that he will rule the world. And God goes on to say to Jesus, you will break them with a rod of iron. You will dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. God has promised that there will be a conflict in the Middle East. Come back to Ezekiel 38 again. Ezekiel 38 in the last few verses. Doesn't matter how many peace treaties are signed in the Middle East. Ezekiel 38 verse 18 says this. It will come to pass at the same time when Gog, the leader of Rosh, Meshach, Tubal, Magog and all the rest, when Gog will come against the land of Israel, says the Lord God, that my God's fury will come up in his face. For in my jealousy and the fire of my wrath have I spoken. Surely in that day there shall be a great Shaking in the land of Israel. Verse 21. And I, God, will call for a sword against him. Who's that? It's against Gog. It's about against Rosh, Meshach, Tubal, Magog, Libya, Ethiopia, and Persia. A sword will be called against them throughout all his mountains. The mountains of Israel, saith the Lord God. Every man's sword against his brother. Verse 23. And I... God will magnify myself and sanctify myself. Note those words. I will sanctify myself by defeating these invaders of my land, the land of my people. And I will be known in the eyes of many nations. The whole world will see God defeat an army that invades the land of Israel. And then what? You can turn to this if you like, it's just a few pages back, but you'll notice in these words in Ezekiel, not 38, but 28, echoes of the last few verses we've just read. Thus says the Lord God, when I shall have gathered the house of Israel from the people who are among, they, among whom they are scattered, and we talked about a nation gathered in from all the earth, the people of Israel, when that has happened and when I shall be sanctified in them in the sight of the heathen. That's what it just said in verse 23. That at the end of this cataclysmic war in the Middle East, God would be sanctified by this battle. Then shall they dwell in their land that I have given to my servant Jacob. We love them for the father's sake. Jacob, the father of the twelve tribes. And they shall dwell safely there, and they shall build houses and plant vineyards. Yea, they shall dwell in confidence when I have executed judgments upon all those that despise them round about. And they shall know that I am Yahweh. 
then peace will arrive. Peace will arrive after God has become involved. Let's turn to our final passage for tonight, Psalm chapter 72. We said we wanted to end with something really positive, something really wonderful. And this chapter, my word, this is just so beautiful. This chapter describes a time after a conflict when nations of the world are brought to their knees by Jesus Christ. Yes, verse 11 talks about that. Yes, he says, all kings shall fall down before him. All nations shall serve him. Verse 9, they that dwell in the wilderness will bow before him. His enemies will lick the dust. Yes, there will be conflict, but after the conflict... Verse 3, the mountains shall bring peace to the people and the little hills by righteousness. Verse 7, in his days, in the days of Jesus Christ, the king who will come, shall the righteous flourish in abundance of peace so long as the moon endures. How long does the moon endure for? I don't know, it, it, it's been there all my lifetime. I assume it's been there all yours. And we can safely assume that the moon will continue to endure for a long time to come. And so, also, the peace that God will establish in the earth. Verse 16. There will be a handful of corn in the earth upon the top of the mountains, the fruit Thereof shall shake like Lebanon. They of the city will flourish like grass of the earth. His name, the name of the King, Jesus Christ, will endure forever. His name shall continue as long as the sun and men shall be blessed in him. All nations will call him blessed. Why? Because there's worldwide peace. Blessed be the Lord God, the God of Israel. Who only does wondrous things. We started by saying that we don't support the Jewish people for political or ideological reasons. We do it because they are beloved of God. And he himself describes himself as the Lord God of Israel and promises that after these human treaties have failed, after the war has been fought, he will bring peace, and it won't just be peace for the Middle East. It'll be peace for the whole world. And we hope that all of us will do what needs to be done, seek out the truth that we might be part of that peace in the age to come.